Um, great. Well, I'm Ryan Zarama. I'm a Hufflepuff. I'm glad to be in here this morning. <laughs> Um, and I'm the uh, owner and CEO of Commerce Guys, a company that I founded in 2009 to do e-commerce on Drupal, and here I am today um, to deliver a keynote on the topic of doing well and doing good, um, which if you've been around is a theme that Dries Boitart, the creator of Drupal, uh, has spoken about through the years, um, and I'll, I'll kind of explain his perspective on it and how I see that playing out in my life, and also a little bit of conflict that I feel about this mission. <laughs> um, but just to... Uh, um, to introduce myself a little bit further, I'm from Greenville, South Carolina in the United States. I was supposed to get here yesterday morning. Uh, thanks to slow flights and misconnections in the United States, I got here late last night instead. Um, so I may pause for a nap session uh, sometime in the middle of this presentation. Um, I got into Drupal uh, 12, over 12 years ago. Um, at the time, I was writing form HTML in my module files, if anybody remembers those days. The, uh, WordPress is still there, you know, if you're <laughs> curious. Um, and I also was just, you know, uh, a, a lone dude kind of hacking away in an apartment upstairs. And since that time, uh, you know, Drupal's been good to me. It's afforded me the opportunity to grow a family, have three beautiful children. I just celebrated my 10-year anniversary with my wife at Universal Studios to go to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Um, and like many of you here, uh, Drupal is like the thing that like makes me, I guess. Like it challenges me. It's what, what um, has provided opportunity for me to grow professionally, um, to, to earn more than the, the uh, minimum wage I was making as I wrote Uber Cart <laughs> uh, over the years. And, and, it, and it provides a future for my children. I think that's part of like what really drives me to participate and just to go to work. I, I, I guess I'd do the same if I was slinging espresso at Starbucks as well. Um, so it's nice that I get to do something that I enjoy a little bit more. Although I do actually have this crazy plan to retire from Drupal in five years when I turn 40 and become a barista. That's my like, <laughs> inverted goal. <laughs> so I missed that part of college, so I'm hoping to kind of flip flop it here. Uh, but to the topic at hand um, on doing well and doing good. Um, Dries was responding several years ago to the, um, I guess, the criticism of himself and of Acquia, his company that he founded in 2007, I believe, um, that they were kind of sucking all of the talent and the initiative and the, the wins out of the Drupal community. And that the business, in some sense, was antithetical to the contribution. That we couldn't be both a, a mission-driven open source project and community and create businesses that were focused on profit and revenue growth and hiring at the same time. And so he wrote a whole blog post that I do commend to you to read because um, he is our project leader, and so what he says tends to filter out downstream, um, that he started you know, Acquia precisely because he felt that open source and the communities that we build around it um, created opportunities for us to be like a, a change factor in the business community, um, to create businesses that both do well and do good. Um, and so I know that, that uh, you know, within their company, and I'm not here to give a, a commercial for Acquia the whole time, <laughs> Uh, but they do focus on giving back, and, and Dries will say that he built the company he did so that he could employ 12 people to work full-time contributing to Drupal through the office of the CTO. And I think that, that many of us have a similar perspective. The reason that I'm regrowing Commerce Guys focused on Drupal Commerce specifically is because the more that we scale our team, the more people we can afford to, to dedicate full-time just to contributing to Drupal. And I know that, that many of the companies in here have the same philosophy. Uh, many of you give back just as much or more than the companies I've already mentioned. And many of you individually sacrifice a lot um, to advance not just um, Drupal and not just helping our fellow man and, and woman here in the community, but also to advancing free software, to, to advancing um, just, just the general principles of software freedom beyond Drupal itself. So there, there's a lot that we do to kind of yeah, make this work. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, to, to kind of dissect Dries' statement just a little bit, and I, I'm a grammar geek at heart. Um, I studied Biblical Greek and Hebrew in college, and I've forgotten every bit of it, um, but I do remember the grammar. And I, I always appreciated uh, you know, having a command of the English language because that's something that we can do in this room better than anybody else in the world. It's amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so Dries formulates uh, the statements with the conjunction and, right? You can do well and do good. These, these two like, goals, like I want to do better, I want to earn more money, I want to have a retirement someday, five years from now, I'm gonna become a barista. Uh, I want to provide a future for my children. I want to do well, and I want to do good. I want to 
consider one another as better than myself. I want to help. I want to give back. And Andres is saying these things are not mutually exclusive when he uses the word and, right? Uh, but I found that you can also swap in a preposition if you want to. And so that you can do well by doing good. Um, if you're studying Greek, this would be the dative of means that indicates the means by which I accomplish my objective. All right, so, so I have grown a career around contributing to Drupal. Um, the, the thing that I'm known for and the thing that I still do on a daily basis is help people learn how to use Drupal Commerce. I think I might actually still answer an Uber card question here and, here and, uh, here and again. Um, but, but each step of the way in my career, um, like becoming a contributor, giving back, helping other people learn how to contribute, developing disciplines that allowed people to work with me, uh, aka code standards, documentation, I'm still not quite doing automated testing, but all of these things like are giving back in ways that have helped me to grow personally and professionally. Um, but what I've begun to feel lately is a different preposition. Um, it's, it's actually some opposition. I felt that um, I'm, I'm on, a, on a mission, it feels like, to do good in spite of or despite doing well. Um, because there, there's a real sense in my life that I felt even like, really critically last month that, that doing well has become the enemy of doing good. Um, because once you start to do well, you don't want to do less well. <laughs> and if you don't want to do less well, then your energies and attentions get shifted toward maintaining this thing that you've built, and I'll explain further on. Uh, but to explain, I'm going to go uh, back and kind of just consider afresh, okay, how did I get to where I am? And I do this, um, you know, not just to show funny photos of me from 10 years ago, uh, or to, to, to have my own little like family slideshow up on the screen, uh, but hopefully um, you can find your story somewhere in the midst of my story because it's a pretty common story in the Drupal community that I think unlike many other Drupal or many other software communities or open source communities in the world, many of us have found uh, like real opportunity by just contributing and giving back and building up this public thing that we all enjoy together. Um, so, so try to find yourself in here, and if you can't, I apologize. Um, I know my experience is not representative of everybody's. Uh, all right, so I, I wanted to think, okay, why did I begin? <laughs> How did I go from this guy um, to this guy? And, and it's funny, too, to, to think that um, 12 years ago I was, I was short-haired and beardless, and open source does a lot to change the way that you look, <laughs> uh, as, as well as the way that you behave and grow. Um, but but I, I, I was fresh out of you know, studying theology. I have no computer science background or training. It was a hobby that I developed hacking on our Commodore 64 through the 80s and 90s, uh, making computer games with my brother. And I actually would make computer games in the dorms and force everybody on my hall to come and challenge me to Red Jumpy Ball and Glide Fighters and a few other little things that I made that are still on the internet today. Um, but, uh, you know, actually, Rob and I had um, a few things in common. Not that we liked to program, because <laughs> he did not. He still doesn't program. Uh, but we did like to help others. And we actually had moved into a neighborhood specifically with the mission to help other people. Um, so uh, it was a kind of a depressed part of the city that we lived in, Louisville, Kentucky. And together we just got an apartment in a, in a, a fairly dangerous place to be. Uh, this will come back up again, which is why I'm kind of describing it a little bit. Um, that was kind of like uh, the tenth deadliest uh, zip code in the United States for murders for a while. I knew who the drug dealers were on my block. I knew when they were stealing my utilities. <laughs> um, I, I knew when I would never see my friends again. Um, sorry. Uh, and, and we uh, and we moved there because we wanted to help people. Um, we wanted people to escape from that uh, the life that would lead them to to dying from. Oxycontin or um, gunshot wounds or whatever else that they were struggling with. And we could not see an impact. I mean, I lived there for, uh, lived there for eight years. And uh, I think I have you know, two friends that I know like, made it out <laughs> from that area. Um, but what I found out in contributing to open source and the Drupal and making this kind of the new center of where I would progress and develop myself was that I could quickly see impact. That was really quite the opposite of where I had been. And I think that that, that desire to impact other people and to, and to really help other people positively change their lives through giving them software and the means to provide for themselves in a way that I couldn't to the people that I lived next to and dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis um, really became rather addicting. I still love it. I'm still subscribed to the Stack Overflow tag for Drupal Commerce and will come answer questions, but I love seeing when people have answered those questions before I get there, so don't stop. 
Um, but uh, uh, you know, to illustrate like just how like how fast this became part of who I was in 2006, I posted my first support request on Drupal.org. Um, I had never heard of version control systems at the time. Um, I think my version control was an FTP server that I just occasionally like lost everything that I was working on on. <laughs> um, and I was trying to download the latest version of the e-commerce mo uh, module, which was the project that preceded Ubercart. And uh, I didn't know how to do it other than clicking through the, <laughs> the, the web-based browser and downloading the files individually. So I went to, to Drupal.org on my birthday, actually, in 2006, and said, hey, um, how do I get this? And Heine, um, who I, I don't believe would be here, I actually haven't seen him in years, but he helped me like almost immediately. If you look at the timestamps, it was like, 34 minutes later, some random stranger from here helped me answer my problem. And I thought it was amazing. So a day later, and this is funny too, 8.34, 8.34, somebody else asked a question. I was like, I know the answer. I can help you do this. Boom. And then, you know, uh, Heine actually responded on this one as well. And so this individual was like, oh, thank you so much, guys. You unblocked me in both the things that I was having problems with. And I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Suddenly, like... This whole world opened up to me that I could use the internet to help other people learn how to use the software that could help them then develop careers that supported them and their families in the same way that I was beginning to find that I could do for mine. Um, which is just amazing. Um, and that eventually led into Ubercart. I was um, developing at the time with OS Commerce, the company that I worked at. Uh, this was kind of like the first big open source e-commerce system. Um, and if, if anybody use OS Commerce, did, any, did anybody play MUDs, multi-user dungeons, text games? I feel like, like I, so I actually had enough, as many hands for MUDs as I did for OS Commerce. Those were like the two things I was into at the time. Um, and I actually hadn't really done a whole lot of like MySQL or JavaScript or PHP, but when my boss said, hey, can you like port OS Commerce into this Drupal thing? I think that content management is kind of the future. I was like, oh, sure. Yeah, we can do this. You know, why, why not? You know? I've never really built anything that, that powered any business, but I could probably create this incredibly complex, rich business application. Sure, let's just, let's just do this thing. <laughs> and so we really tongue-in-cheek called it Ubercard because we were just being stupid. But like by the time people knew it as Ubercard, we couldn't change the name. Um, <laughs> and so even, even like the tagline, one card to rule them all, it was just being like really like faux pretentious and stupid because Lord of the Rings was still big at the time. And yeah, yeah, but we had a, we had a good time. And, and Lyle, you know, Lyle became part of the family. You know, he's there at my daughter's birth. Um, we're still friends now. He's having children, and it's been a, you know really fun to see like how these friendships have developed around the software over time. I, I recently posted to my blog a similar story with Bojan Jovanovic, my co-maintainer for Drupal Commerce, and like this is what Drupal is for me. It's like helping people, seeing people grow, being a part of their story to develop themselves and develop careers and learn more, um, and it's just been been incredibly fun and rewarding. Uh, but I didn't encounter the Drupal community until a year later at DrupalCon Barcelona, where I just kind of showed up and gave a few talks about Ubercard. And I thought nobody like, knew anything about this, but like all 400 people there had like, used Ubercard when I showed up. I was like, whoa, I just stepped into something I didn't mean to step into. I was actually dubbed Mr. Ubercard at Barcelona. <laughs> and then I, I actually went back and rewatched my presentation from DrupalCon Boston, which is the next slide. Um, but in Boston, by, by that time, actually, my wife had sort of adopted the moniker Mrs. Ubercard as well. So we were <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Ubercard, and, and we were just like helping people learn how to create e-commerce websites, literally to run their businesses. Because like the Drupal agency market at the time was still pre pretty immature, and we did have companies like Lullabot, um, Acquia was just getting started around Boston. I'm sure who, who had a Drupal agency in 2008? Were there many? One? Yeah, two. It wouldn't. Yeah, not not a whole lot around. Some that were around were Rain City Studios, Bright, and others that have now gone defunct and shut down. Um, but um, I, I went back to watch this presentation because I remembered presenting at DrupalCon Boston. This was my first time in front of a room that had hundreds of people like this room this morning, and uh, I, I wasn't like super nervous because again, part of my college had been like having to learn to do public speaking and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I but I also was like. Um, completely free to be myself. I hadn't really been in the Drupal community before, so getting up on stage and presenting was really just like, a, like an avenue for self-expression, not a thing that I had to do to like really make sure I had a business message or you know, really presented my company in the best light or opened up new opportunities. Like, I wasn't thinking about any of that. And, and I went back and watched my first slide. Like, I literally stood up in front of everybody and said, hey, like, you know, before I even talk about anything this morning, I just want everybody here to know that I think people are, are more important than computers and relationships are worth more than dollars. 
And it was like my value statement, like at the very first time that I spoke in a big DrupalCon, you know, crowd. And, um, and like, like just remembering that this is where I was has been really kind of like convicting in the last month because I haven't started a session like that in a long time. And I, and I don't know why. Um, or I, I guess I have some ideas, oh, but it's just not that time of the presentation yet. Um, and so, so this is where I was in 2008. Um, and then, of course, uh, after DrupalCon in Boston, we founded Drupal Commerce to really support Ubercart at the time. I found that it was two friends that I met through Ubercart. Um, we went skiing on a lake together and then became BFFs and started this commerce guys thing. Because why not? This is what you do when you're young and you don't have, uh, well, you have a $500 mortgage and no children. You have to feed, you like, sure, I can start a company. Whatever, it's not a big deal. Um, but we, we ran it for a year. We started Drupal Commerce. We merged with the French team of, uh, the Drupal team of AF83. And then we did the whole like venture capital thing to kind of foster the adoption of Drupal Commerce and then build platform.sh, um, which, uh, yeah, is, is still going today, but we've now like separated out the businesses um, as of two years ago. And of course, the main thing that we focused on was building Drupal Commerce, which is basically like taking Ubercart, which we did first for Drupal 5 and then for Drupal 6, and then reimagining it for Drupal 7 around the whole like fieldable entity system, and at the same time driving a lot of that change. Like, Drupal Commerce was the first project that really showed that you could use the field API to create your data model and then allow it to be configurable and remixed and whatever else. And like, organic groups followed, um, Red Hat CRM followed, a variety of other distributions and module you know, projects followed that then all contributed to this work. Some of our client projects that were built around this also resulted in Drupal core improvements. So Views is in core now, and that has form functionality that was developed to support Drupal Commerce. The entity reference uh, module is in Drupal 8 core now. That was born out of um, the Drupal Commerce build that we did for Cartier at uh, Commerce Guys in Paris. And, and a lot of things from the projects we just were always trying to find, okay, how do we drive this back into the community? And, and even today, like, and you know, this is probably pretty common for the room, but as a business owner, like, all of my contracts have guarantees that like any code that I write that improves or fixes an issue in an open source project must be contributable back, right? Like the client is saying, yes, you have my permission. Uh, and, and that's important, like you do need that copyright release if you're doing work for somebody else. But it's important to secure those rights because that then is all part of doing good while we do well. Somebody is paying me to do my work, but I'm ensuring this is stuff that we can distribute back out and, and we can all benefit from it. And, and, it, and it shows in the, the success of Drupal Commerce. And that today, by my calculations, and these are reverse engineering some statistics that we get from Drupal.org, um, from payment gateway partners like PayPal and Authorize.net. Like there's over one and a half billion dollars of transactions that flow through Drupal Commerce sites on an annual basis. And that's that's not like huge in the grand scheme of things. I'm sure Magento is up to like 10 billion by now or more. Um, but you know it's still growing. And just last year we saw the case study come through Drupal.org, um, where a Chinese fast food franchise is now now processing up to one billion dollars a year on their own of you know, food sales from all of their stores because they use Drupal as the back end for their point of sale system and, and their fulfillment and payment resolution servers and everything else that they do. So like there, there's this incredible impact um, that's been born out of this community project and, and many like, who here has contributed to Drupal Commerce? Like I know that we have a lot of contributors like in the UK and Europe in general really appreciate it. Like it, it's all part of this story of doing good as we do well. Um, and so here we are today um, with a Commerce Guys 3.0, if you will. Um, two years ago, uh, I was able to separate the Commerce Guys and Drupal Commerce business out of Platform.sh and, and kind of relaunch it. And it was just myself, Boyan Jovanovich, and Matt Glom, and my co-maintainers at the time. Um, we've grown up to eight people. Two of them are, are fully dedicated to contributing back to Drupal. Um, even as a three-person team, we were like the number two or three contributor to Drupal, if you looked at the listings on Drupal.org because we just have prioritized giving back and contributing from the get-go. Um, and and we, have, we have some economics that, that help us, obviously. We, we had a 10-year foundation of doing Ubercart and Drupal Commerce to build on coming into the business. So I, I know that's not like feasible for every new Drupal company to just like, dedicate somebody full-time right off the bat, but it's feasible for many of us to do more. Um, and, and today, um, you know, now we've been in business two years, we have our, our sort of war chest, our rainy day fund tucked away in the bank, which if you aren't doing that as a business, I highly recommend it, and I highly recommend avoiding credits. It's your free financial tip. Um, but uh, we've now scaled to the point where we have additional revenue left over. And for the first time now in two years, we've been like, okay, how can I use this to now continue to foster the adoption of Drupal Commerce, which means helping more people use Drupal Commerce. 
Because um, at the end of the day, like, just because there are more sites than people that doesn't mean there's more money in our pocket, but it does mean that our impact is continuing to grow and grow. Um, so, you know, to sum it all up, you know, both I personally and commerce guys corporately um, have, have prospered and benefited by giving back and really by making that a priority. Commerce Kickstart 2.x was, was just a complete cost sink. I mean, we probably spent around a half million dollars developing what became the number one Drupal distribution purely because we wanted to help people get into Drupal commerce easier. <laughs> These tools needed to exist, but they're expensive. They take a lot of time and energy and investment. And we were able to dedicate people to it for months and you know months on end. Um, but that investment in giving back then resulted in you know our ability to reach out to technology partners and to tell Amazon and to tell PayPal and Authorize and Mailchimp, hey, like there's a thing here. You guys should come invest in it. And so now, if you go to DrupalCon in Nashville, you'll see many of these people are sponsors of the event. And they've all come to help us kind of grow the pie together. So we, we prospered and benefited by giving back. But that success um, feels threatening to the mission. Um, and, and like last month was kind of a bad month for me. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know why. It's just like a lot of things kind of came to a head. Um, and uh, like I could probably point out some funny things. Oh, Bitcoin slid and so I lost, you know, $20,000 in, in imaginary dollars or something. But like it wasn't Bitcoin. It wasn't turning 35 and having a mid, you know, mid, uh, early midlife crisis. Um, it wasn't the two all-nighters uh, that I pulled in one week and then the one the week following and then the one last night to get here. <laughs> um, you know, it, like, but it was some, some combination of the things that, that it wasn't the events themselves that, that led me to, to become introspective, but it was rather just the events highlighted and gave me like, room to think really soberly about like, okay, who am I becoming? What's, what's going on here? And I, I just want to kind of illustrate using my garden. <laughs> um, has anybody, you know, tilled, you know, fresh grass to create a garden before? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really rewarding. Like, I really love the end product. <laughs> um, to be able to see, like, wow, look at this, this thing. Like, I'm going to be able to put tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers. Actually, we never do good with cucumbers or squash. I don't know why, but we get the blight. But, like, we'll grow so much in this little patch. You know, it's 100 square feet, but we'll have more than enough for our family, for our neighbors. It's going to be amazing, right? And uh, you quickly come to find out that, well, okay, the fence wasn't high enough to keep this animal out. The rabbits found a way in, the birds have eaten the seed, and the weeds, the grass is coming back. And, and suddenly, like, just maintaining this open patch of, of land where I hoped to grow produce to benefit my family and my neighbors, like, it, like I had to spend all my energies just maintaining this thing. And, the, and now, if I had a picture of this garden, it's depressing. It's just like a tarp that we put down to try to kill the weeds from last year. Um, but, like, uh, you know, the, the ambition, the, the mission, the reasons that we built this thing, like they didn't change, but maintaining the thing kind of became what we had to do. We had to spend our time and energy and effort just maintaining what we built. Otherwise, like, it would just be consumed again, right? And this is what I feel like a business is like. <laughs> um, you can grow it to eight people, but suddenly, like, my whole day is, okay, did I send all the invoices? Have I reviewed all the contracts? Have I paid everybody this month? Andras, you're a saint. Here's two months pay because I forgot you last month. Um, boy, I need an invoice for you because I think you'd like to get paid eventually too, right? Oh, and, and look at this. I have three events coming up and I haven't finalized my logos yet. And I need to print t-shirts. And, and, and suddenly, like, all these things come up. Not because, like, you just, like, want to be concerned with the mechanics of running a business, but you have to do them or your business goes away. <laughs> and this is what I tell my wife whenever I'm working all night again. It's like, well, look, I, I, don't, I don't feel like anybody's pressuring me to do this. But I feel like if I don't do this, none of us eat next month. And that would be really sad. Um, and so like, just maintaining the garden you know, has become like, the thing that I have to focus on, which then, of course, decreases the amount of time and energy that I have to do good, not just within the Drupal community, but hey, what about within my own family? Because I can carve out to protect family time, you know, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. is sacrosanct. I'll be there for dinner. I'll be there for you know, songs and prayers and bedtimes. and then you know, maybe go either back to work or crash on the couch and watch Parks and Rec with my wife, you know, any of the above. Um, but, um, you know, there's always more to do. And, and I'm not the kind of person, um, I guess you would ever say, like, I feel stressed. You know, I just don't really have to, like, use that in my vocabulary. But what I have found out is I am the kind of person that will say things like, I'm just letting so many people down. I'm just dropping the ball. 
Um, I, I should be doing better, and there's just more to be done, and I don't know how I'm going to escape from this hole. And am I, am I losing my way, in a sense? Like, it's easy, you know, it's easy to get lost in the weeds, uh, which here doesn't just mean details, it means the things that actually threaten the mission. <laughs> um, and it's not just, like, mechanics of running a business. Um, it's also things like, since when did I make decisions about what I would do in the event, um, you know, based on how that might profit me? Um, when, did I, when did I respond to business relationships out of fear that if I like, piss somebody off, I might lose $100,000 in revenue for my company next year, or create an enemy who could just consume me because they have a bigger AdWords budget than I do or something? When, when did I let those become the things that directed how I spent my time? Um, when, when did I decide that um, like I had to have a beer or a cocktail with every meal? And, and when, did, when did going on business trips become like an habitual opportunity to have three or four cocktails instead of just a drink with my friends afterward. Um, and, and was I like on a trajectory of becoming an alcoholic who used alcohol to, to deal with the stress that I didn't even know how to identify? Like I was really feeling these things last month, and um, and I'm not Catholic, but I gave up liquor for Lent because all right, let's just let's just like cut it out like, to make sure that this is not the thing that is becoming to define me, and 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 in a way that I'm, that I'm coping with. Like the weeds that are actively trying to like tear down the mission of doing well and doing good, um, and, and like just like I, I kind of yeah really just came to the end of myself last month wondering okay what what could I possibly do to reverse this um, because I really had forgotten I guess like how I got there in the first place so that's kind of what what you know brings me to the the, the main question right how can we maintain our values how can we not lose it as we grow, because we do want to do better. I, I want everybody in here to do well, to advance in their career, to lead teams, to start businesses that succeed. I, I went to a conference one time and, and heard a guy kind of stand up and proclaim to the audience, he's like, there's money out there that belongs to you and you should be earning it. You know? And it's, it's a very like, gung-ho, like, capitalist mindset. But the reality is, if that money does come into our companies and we scale our businesses, that does give us who are mission driven and mission focused and focused on doing good while doing well, it gives us the ability to do more. You know, it gives Dries the ability to hire more people today, you know, to dedicate them to giving back. Um, it gives us, you know, in our um, uh, philanthropic capacities as, as donors and members of other nonprofits that we're part of to do more with them and for them to give more away. So, like, I do want us to do well, and I want us to do well by doing good. I don't want this to just be coincidental in my life for sure. Um, and and uh, again, I, I do have a background in theology, and so like, whenever I'm, like, the, 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 the things that come up in the background of my mind are, are these, these words that honest, honestly, like, were haunting because I feel like I lost my, my script for a while. And it's, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, to forfeit his soul? You know, what, what, what would be the good of me becoming the best me in business leadership that I could be if I forgot that like, I got into this because I just really liked to help other people learn and do better for themselves? Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are. <laughs> um, and so I, I'd like to just kind of make some observations and then invite feedback because I don't have it figured out. Um, I'm, I'm still in the middle of trying to reset myself, to reset my company, um, to reset things with my family so that their expectations are, are different and, and that they can expect and get better from me. Um, but the first thing that I, that I remember is that the, the reason that I learned things, the reason I was motivated to learn how to be a better developer the reason I was motivated to establish disciplines that made it easier for people to collaborate with me, like adhering to code standards, documenting my code, um, collaborating on a roadmap, that all these things are soft skills in a sense, but those really matter in an open source community. The reason I did that was because learning gave me the ability to help people better. <laughs> um, it wasn't just because it gave me the ability to now go and like hoard my knowledge in my ivory tower and charge more for my services, it meant that I could actually help more people better. It meant that I could write better software that didn't have as many bugs next time. And it meant that I could incorporate people into my development process so that they could do better and they could grow. And um, I, I recently posted in my blog a birthday message to Boyan Giovanna, which I mentioned this earlier, but seeing like his trajectory, and, and this, maybe this is part of what caused me to, to reflect on my last eight years, was remembering his story, because his birthday was a few days after mine. And, and eight years ago, he was my Google, or my Google Summer of Code mentee. 
you know, he, he was a, a young Drupal contributor, and I was able to help him learn Drupal as he wrote an affiliate module for Drupal Commerce, <coughs> and then brought him into Commerce guys, saw him develop, we appointed him into the, to the Kickstart 2.x project, and then eventually after DrupalCon Austin, I made him the project lead for Drupal Commerce 2.x, because frankly I was burnt out on recreating the e-commerce system for every Drupal version year after year. Um, and he's done so much better at it than I ever could have. And so seeing him develop like has been fantastic and knowing that like the disciplines that I've developed are not benefiting him and that like he's trained now himself more agencies and more teams and more people than I ever could have myself and he continues to do it to this day, it's fantastic. So, so as you learn and acquire knowledge and acquire skills, think how can I wield this to help other people in the Drupal community better? How can I help somebody else improve? How can I go from posting my first support request on Drupal.org one day to then giving support the next day without anybody having to prod me into it just because that seemed like the natural thing to do. And that was on like the old support forums. Stack Exchange is far and away a better venue for giving support than, than the old forums were. But how, how can you do that? So think, think this as the developer, as the new Drupal developer, the new Drupal user, site builder, who, wh in whatever capacity you serve, your learning skills that you can use to help other people. And then as you, as you grow as a leader, you know, you stop acquiring as many technical skills um, I, I've maybe learned, you know, a few new things <laughs> over the last few years. Uh, of course, I had to learn object-oriented PHP along with everybody else so that we could all adopt Symfony and get into Drupal 8. Um, I learned R for a little while to, to run a side project selling analytics to power companies. And it wasn't so successful, we didn't mock all that. Um, and I think, shoot, I, I, it's, it's just not as much as, as it used to be. But, but what I am learning is, is, like, leadership skills. I'm learning a lot of things about what to do and not do in contracts. <laughs> uh, if you need to know what not to do, come talk to me afterwards. Um, <clears throat> but, I, but I'm also having to learn, like real aggressively learn, about my own shortcomings. Because uh, you know, the blocker to Drupal Commerce's advancement today isn't does Ryan know how to use Git or CVS or whatever. It's actually like, does Ryan know how to consistently get up at 8 a.m. and work until 5 p.m. and not get sidetracked by Twitter, Facebook, and the news? Uh, does Ryan know how to stay motivated even as his business is doing well and he doesn't have to wonder where his next paycheck is going to come from because his business has like, like how, how, do you, how do you stay motivated once you actually have achieved enough success to stop working for a year? Like, that's actually like a really hard question to answer because you do have to find a new source of motivation. It's not just, not just to earn a paycheck because I have a mortgage payment that if I don't make it this month, I won't pay next month. Um, but like, there's some intrinsic motivation that you have to learn to develop. That, that is just like a new experience for me, and sure that it will be for many of you as you continue to grow as a leader. And then what you have to do once you do come into a leadership position of a small company, of a team within a larger company, is to really work hard to free your team up to do more good in aggregate than you ever could do on your own. This is like the power of multiplication, right? This is why Dries may not write code for Drupal anymore, but he has all of these different uh, teams and working groups and various people and initiative leads and people that, that are contributing and writing code. And actually, even many of the initiative leads and the core committers don't even write the code anymore themselves, right? It's, but he has found ways to multiply himself so that his team does a lot more good in aggregate than he ever could if he just were still that, that single guy in a dorm room wearing his red sombrero, if you know the picture, you know, hacking away on Drupal. Um, so so this, this is a mindset shift there, right? It's not just about the bottom line. It's not just about making my team more efficient because then we'll be more profitable. Um, within my company at Commerce Guys, we only, like, we actually wrote the financial model assuming that each of our full-time billable resources would only bill 24 hours a week. And I think it's probably typical for a services company to peg that at 32 to 35 hours a week, which to me sounds impossible because when I would, like, really try hard to put time on the clock, I can't really get past, like, six or seven hours a day. So I can imagine being in an environment even where they like expect 40 hours to build a work that would kill me. Um, like, oh, I guess I just have to be more disciplined. Now, obviously, we've established that's a problem for me. <laughs> um, but uh, but but it is like like a mindset shift. Okay, like not only do I need to free these people, though, I need to free up Boyan and Matt and Andras and Jonathan and Lisa and Milan and Stephen to do more good than I could do if I was just doing everything myself. That requires leadership development in its own right because I have to be able to hand things off to them. Um, but, I, but I also just need to make that like the objective of the business. And so I think about now as, as a business owner, what can I do to make sure that, the, the, that doing good doesn't fall by the wayside as we do well? And, and what can I do not just to make the equation do well and do good, but also do well by doing good? 
And really it is to define, this is, this is basic business stuff if you went to business school, but it's actually really hard to implement in practice. But just to lead with core values, to actually define core values. Commerce guys didn't do that until I took it over. I said, all right, first thing we're going to do is establish core values and set a mission for ourselves. Because we've never done this before. The mission was always just, I don't know, let's make money with triple commerce, woo, um, as a business. And so like, that allowed us to make decisions that actually weren't necessarily in our best interests. They actually, uh, that, that turned into Platform.sh and Drupal Commerce slowly after thing until we were able to buy our way out and recreate what we were building. Um, for us, our, our two primary core values are impact and initiative. And so in every proposal that I send out, I'm reinforcing to the market, I'm reinforcing to my, my clients that that's why we're here. Like we want to have an outsized impact, not just on your organization, but also within our open source community. This is what drives us and motivates us. And, we we're, we're toying around with the idea of adding some additional eyes, but it feels kind of kitschy after a while. Like, oh yeah, it's initiative and impact and integrity and iteration. Uh, uh, but, so at least we know that we have two core values and we can lead with those until we figure out the rest. Uh, and, and we're kind of trying to figure out, okay, we purpose the mission statement as well. Uh, but this actually comes back again to go full circle um, to another blog post that I'll come into you from Dries. Um, that uh, I think it was on the hard choices he has to make every day because there's only so many things that you can do each day. And part of what, what I don't identify as stress, but what is stress, is knowing that there are good things that I should be doing that I'm not doing on a day after day after day after day. Um, and, and so he actually wrote a whole post talking about that from his perspective. And, and his solution was to basically start each day thinking about how he could optimize the things that he did that day for impact, passion, and, uh, and purpose. Um, and trust that these things will align. Um, and and that's, that's what I'm trying to do, is to optimize the business for impact, even, even to the extent of setting short-term and long-term goals for us as a company that are not revenue-based. Um, so like, it would be one thing to say, I want Commerce Guys to do a million dollars next year, 1.2 the year after that, uh, 1.32 or whatever, I'm doing the math wrong, I think, but you know, that's like 10% growth or 20% growth year over year. Like, it's really, like, that's the natural way to plan a company. And, and there is some sense in which, as a business owner, you do have to plan revenue growth, or else what you'll end up with is less revenue. Um, next year, but what if our business goals were actually oriented around impact, things that could appear to be vanity metrics, but are not vain because they actually tie to real world impact. Like things like module usage count for us, you know, as, as the maintainers of Drupal Commerce. Like in one sense that is a, like the epitome of a vanity metric because how many sites are poured in the Drupal.org that they're using the Commerce module is a meaningless number when you consider that probably at least 10 to 20 percent of those are development environments and staging environments that are pinging Drupal.org as well. Um, but if I think about it as, well, actually this, is, this still represents tens of thousands of businesses that are able to run because we maintain this open source software together. Like, that's really incredible. How can I say, well, next year, like, we want to measure our impact in this fashion. Is this, the number of teams that we've trained so that other Drupal agencies are building and launching successful 2.x sites? Or is it you know, just not even related to the project at all? Is it related to the amount of dollars we're able to give away to free software um, you know, initiatives or to um, you know, Shyamala's initiative to, to fight against human trafficking in India and, and other things, and so the development of women in India? Like, can we optimize for impact in those ways as business owners and leaders that aren't just tied to revenue just tied to are we making more money <laughs> for ourselves and our team. We want to make more money because that lets us multiply our impact, but impact is the goal, not a bigger house. Or <coughs> um, so that's, that's the end for me. Um, you know, I've asked the question of myself over and over again, what, is it, what does it profit me to gain the whole world and forfeit my soul? How do I keep the reason I'm doing the things that I'm doing in the things that I'm doing? How do I keep that my driving force? I, and like, I'm just at the start of like rediscovering that journey, so I appreciate your encouragement to this end. If you see me screwing it up, call me out. <laughs> I'll retweet you. <laughs> um, but uh, I also, you know, I, I'm happy to field questions until 10.30, but also we, we really invite feedback from people who have found ways to make impact the primary driver for their business, not expressed as dollars and cents, but expressed as kind of tangential or secondary things. So I'd be really curious to hear how that's working for anybody else. Um, so we do have microphones if there are questions. If not, we can also just end it there. Uh, yes? Oh. We'll run it up. <laughs> Hi. Um, this was a question about that thing about um, uh, doing, uh, doing 
good, good, doing well by doing good. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, because I can see how in the early days when you contribute back and do a lot, you kind of gain a name for yourself, so you're more likely to have people come to you as a company. But it feels like the more you contribute, the more you market, the more successful something like commerce is, the more other companies can start doing it, but they don't have to pay for generating commerce like you have to do with the full-time developers. So it seems like there's this kind of weird thing where the more successful you are, are from a business point of view in the Drupal community, the more you cannibalize yourself. Yeah. Is that a problem? Do you just decide, you know what, I care about it from an altruistic point of view, or is there something that I'm missing and there are actually other ways that you can do well by doing good past that initial stage? Yeah. No, you, you really hit the, the nail right on the head. Um, that, you know, if you do carve out like a, a subset of Drupal, like Drupal Commerce is like this new industry that you're developing, right? How many millions of dollars go toward Drupal Commerce projects today? Like any other business worth their salt is going to see like, oh, I can add an additional quarter million dollars to my revenue next year and a million dollars the year after if I make that my niche. <laughs> and, and yeah, if you're, if you're running a mission-driven team that's small, like we, I mean, we were literally three people at the start of 2016 and we're trying to regrow now since separating from platform. Um, like it's easy to be consumed, and that's and I think that that, that that actual that tension is part of what caused me to have this crisis. Like, wow, if I don't grow the business and find ways to multiply my team, like we will lose the ability to provide for ourselves by doing good. And I, and I don't I don't have a great answer for that because I think like that's that's the tension that I feel. Like part of I guess part of the reason we can do it. Is because we, we do practice like really conservative financial planning and expectations, right? So I know like 24, 24 hours a week billable, like that's pretty easy to achieve. Whenever we started the business, like my my budget for that first year was okay. If we can just bill a hundred hours a month as a three person team, we can make this work. You know, so so we weren't we weren't trying to grow outside of our means. And then also you know over the course of the last year, like we've actually done a lot better than I anticipated. So we've been able to save up a rainy day fund where we could just. Like if suddenly like the bottom dropped out of my business, like we'd have like six months to figure it out. <laughs> and so, so I think that, that there is some sense of like the, what's the old parable? Uh, like like the, the, the ant and the grasshopper, the ant works all winter to store up foods so that when winter comes, it doesn't starve and the grasshopper's kind of left to its own devices to go and you know, starve to death outside in the cold, poor guy. Um, but, but by just kind of being a bit more conservative, um, that has freed us from some of the normal uh, like things that might drive a business to make bad decisions, to saddle themselves with debt, you know, by uh, making payroll on a line of credit instead of having a rainy day fund you can tap into, um, to, to take on contracts that you shouldn't take on because you just need the money and then they turn into a, a horror show, <laughs> which, you know, we, I still do on occasion on accident. Um, but, um, but so, so you, like, that's, that's probably like the job of the business owner in this environment is how do I free my team up to just focus on doing good and giving back? And then I find a way to tie that to increasing revenue so that we can increase our footprint and scale our services and, and kind of uh, shore, shore up the breach, if you will, or prevent it from becoming a problem. So, so no, not a good answer, but that's, that's, the, that's the pain point. <laughs> um, we, had a, we had a question up front here. I, I just wanted to ask um, how... I just wanted to ask, how, to, to what extent do you make the ideals and, and values you've been talking about part of the company ethos as a whole, with all of the employees, all yeah. of the way the company as a whole behaves, not just you? Yeah, um, so uh, that's a, a great question, and it's something that we've been able to do really intentionally as we've rebuilt, because I knew that my two core team members, Matt and Boyan, um, were aligned with me already, and then they all, they, like, they're, they're men of high integrity, they're men who really do value impact, they do take initiative, um, and, and they, want, like, they also value giving back and see their own careers in the same light as I see mine. It's like really like a communi communal community success, and they wanted to give back. And so we set these core values in mission, and we have a daily stand-up, we're a distributed team, um, so every day for 30 minutes we connect, and this is part of why I have our billable expectations set lower, so that we can afford to connect on a daily basis for 30 minutes. And we've done that as we've gone. So we now have eight people every day, 30 minutes, where we get in and have our stand up and talk about what we're doing. And at the top of the week, um, we kind of take turns every week. Somebody will have to restate the mission and somebody will have to um, restate the, the values and explain them from their perspective. And it changes week to week. Like my perspective on what impact looks like changes from month to month as different things happen. But we're always tying back. Like 
the, the previous week to those values. And then we also end the week with props. So at the end of the week, you're reinforcing to the rest of the team um, as you pass the microphone off to the next person in the video call, you know, what did Steven do well today? What has Lisa really done well today? And make sure that like, we're reinforcing within the team, like, these things matter. I appreciate you. People are more important than computers and relationships are worth more than dollars. And then, whenever we're hiring people, um, I make it part of my pitch to them, like, hey, like, we'd really love to have you on our team. We see you as somebody who takes initiative, values giving back and contributing to Drupal. Um, here's who we are. This is our mission. These are our values. Like, and uh, hopefully they would select themselves out if they don't match those values. But we've used them in hiring decisions and in, you know, whether or not to retain people and so on. Um, and then, of course, last thing I mentioned, like our proposals also restate this. And our, and our, our clients understand this about us. So we really have worked to make it part of our DNA. Um, and, and now I want to do the next part of that work, which is to actually craft a business plan that isn't just uh, dollars and headcount on a spreadsheet, but is measurable and growing impact um, that, that even grows at a faster rate than our top line revenue. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Alright, great. Any other questions? So Brian, oh. I yes, I just want to say thanks for being such an open presentation and uh, I think everyone, it's really hard running a business, as you just said, but you've been like so open about it. I think there's lots of agency owners in the room You've probably gone through some of the things you're going through, and but maybe wouldn't have been so open. And it's really heartwarming to like hear some of the things you said. Um, I think you know you have like business development, logistics, HR, finance. I think I mentioned project and recruitment. Yeah. And um, clients tell me sometimes, you know, stop emailing us at three in the morning. It's not very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Not being coherent. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just looking around the audience, I mean, I used to be, I, I, I hope I've improved as a boss and a business owner, but I was looking around, I can see like people I used to work with like in the audience, like Nicole and Paul and John and Paul and probably John Durant, Audrey's, like there's those people in the community I've worked with over the years and still do, fortunately. So I know we've only got two minutes left, so I'm going to wrap this up. <laughs> yeah, there, really, there isn't a question. It's just a thank you for sharing it. And I think uh, there's two statements really. One is you'll definitely get through it. There's a saying from the film like all's well um, in the end. And if it's not well, then it's not the end. And I forgot the other thing I was going to say. But that'll do that. <laughs>